Welcome back to the Think Bigger Real Estate Show. I am your host, Justin Stoddart, and I'm thrilled today to bring two really high producing professionals um, to the show, to the audience, to really teach us three things. Number one, how to grow business in this uh, tight market. Number one, how to grow a team and how to grow wealth. And then at the end, we've got a little treat for you on how to grow yourself, so don't miss that. But I'm excited to bring today's guest to the table. It's Jamie and Shereen Beltran of Beltran Properties right out of Wilsonville, Oregon. Thank you two so much for joining me today. Thanks for having us. Thanks Justin. for having us, Justin. Yeah, it's my pleasure, guys. Um, let me just also remind the audience that um, inside of the Think Bigger Real Estate group on Facebook, if you're not yet a member of that, be sure and go sign up for that group because in there I'll take snippets, kind of the very best snippets and nuggets from the shows. We'll put them in there and really encourage people to grow with that, you know, with those concepts. So um, again, that's a great place to, to continue to grow yourself, which is my passion. So, and I know it's you, it's your passion as well. That's why I like you guys so much as we have a lot in common when it comes to that of, of growth, growth minded. Uh, let's start off with kind of some of the nuts and bolts, kind of the, you know, the tackling and, and, you know, just the basic fundamentals of real estate. Obviously we're in a very tight market. Uh, you know, we've got people that are listening to this in other parts of the country. Our inventory here in the Portland metro area was 0 0.8 months, right? In, um, you know, is, is kind of a new record, a new low. Jamie, how are you? I know you kind of oversee the production side of your business. Um, how are you navigating that? What advice and what tips would you have for agents <laughs> that are listening to, to still thrive amidst, you know, this, this uh, current market? Uh, appreciate that, Justin. Um, I think uh, one of the biggest things that I've focused on specifically since the pandemic has started is my past clients. Um, uh, I, I can't speak highly, more highly about being in touch with those clients, being in touch with the folks that I have already mm -hmm. um, helped in the past, um, whether that is seeking um, further business from them or seeking referrals from them. Um, it, we all know it, it, it's very difficult right now to network. It, it, it's it's much more challenging to go out and prospect um, than it was in the previous years. Even when it comes to the good old fashioned open houses, you know that is something that's not happening quite as much just because of potentially the seller's concerns or just um, mandates from the state. Right. Yeah. So um, for me, it has been a real focus on. Um, my past clients and you know i'm pretty proud that last year we had over 80 percent um past client referral business that's impressive guys it says a lot about the service that you you offer it was funny i was asked uh jamie you've attended top agent masterminds that i've done in the past i was actually in one yesterday and um the question came up like i've got a database this was an agent very successful agent he said i've got a um you know a database of twenty one thousand people and i'd love tips and ideas on how to stay in contact with them we're all like 21,000 people, holy cow. Mm -hmm. And I kind of, we all came to the conclusion that that um, it's really hard to keep track of that many people without being very vanilla, right? Being very mm -hmm. drip campaign-ish. And, um, you know, the advice that that he said was the most valuable to him was kind of the analogy of pruning a tree. Is that the tree actually gets stronger when you prune it, right? It doesn't get weaker. And I think um, your emphasis on past clients says a lot about that strategy, right? Of like, we're not trying to serve everybody in, you know, this town of 25,000 people even, it's who are the people who have already chosen us once and that are likely, like they've already experienced who you are. They've already said yes to you. It's now how do they say yes to you again and or help their friends say yes to you as well? Yeah. In fact, um, one of the things that we implemented a few years ago, we just call it Jamie's top 40 list. And those top 40 clients are the people that he stays in touch with on a regular um, it's phone calls, it's FaceTime, it's voice to voice, it's, you know, golf. Drop ins, um, <laughs> it's everything, but we really, really hyper-focus that. And then the database itself is, you know, kind of some of the more traditional like email marketing campaigns and, you know, even texts and calls too, but definitely we really try to focus in. Top 40. That's, I mean, you guys produce at a really high level. I don't know if you feel comfortable sharing kind of either closed units or GCI, or I know it's... Sure big, right? I mean, so yeah. Yeah. okay, let's talk last year. What did you guys do last year? How many deals did you guys close last year? Last year we closed, I, I believe it was 87. Okay. 87 transactions, which is low, you know, um, which is, it, it is lower than normal. We, we had about 40 million in production. Um, but I think most folks were down, you know, there was a third less transactions that happened in the Portland metro area. Yeah. Um, so, um, that said, uh, we were pretty proud, um, of what we accomplished. Um, you know, I've always 
fancied myself as a as a fourth quarter agent where a lot of agents are on vacation you know calling it in you know i i talk to co-ops and they're like it's been a rough year you know it was a good year and you know i'm like wait a minute it's, it's september <laughs> the year's not over yet we got october november you know um real proud to say that my fourth quarter was the biggest fourth fourth quarter of of, of the year for us um uh, might have been for a lot of folks the first and second quarter with the emergence of the pandemic really slowed things down um but uh we were able to nearly double our volume in the in the fourth quarter last year um and you know we were super blessed by that um typically though i i have a goal of closing 100 transactions a year myself um that's excluding my team on, on an average we close anywhere from 125 to 150 transactions for about 50 million dollars um, so, um, you know, that's kind of our yeah. past, call it 10 years. Great. Um, so, so each year you've got a hundred more past clients coming into your database. Do you gr like, do you expand that number 40 or you keep it at 40? You just keep like, I keep it at 40, but people come in and out. We change it. Um, uh, you know, some people emerge into it and, um, a lot of it is by really by the referrals they're giving me. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, I, I have, um, business allies that are in that group. I also have the majority of them though are our families that I've helped in the past that I identify as real um, just um, influencers. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm seeking those influencers in order to get into their um, sphere and get into relationship with these people because I know that they're going to be out there talking. You know, I, um, I love this concept of focusing on like less is actually more, right? When you try and keep your arm around thousands of people, uh, nobody feels very much love, right? Whereas mm -hmm. if you can really narrow it down, I love that you said that, Shereen, of like, no, we're constantly, that's, that 40 is like an exclusive club, right? And I don't know that you mm -hmm. would you know, um, necessarily yeah. mean that, but I think it's important for people to like to realize like that we can, we can love on at a really, really high level, 40 people. Um, everyone's going to get love, but like, there's a group here that's going to get extra. And, and you said something, Jamie, that I'm going to use this as a, as kind of a, a, a shameless plug for something that I've been working on for some time now, which is my book, the upstream model, right? Which mm -hmm. the concept of this is, is there are certain people in the marketplace who have the ability to send you lots of referrals every year, not like one or two, but like lots because of what they do for a living. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you kind of mentioned that, like there's business affiliates that you work with who, again, it's, they're upstream from you. Like they know that someone has a, a real estate need in their future. And so naturally they're going to be like, if you add enough value to them, that they can become extremely valuable resources for you, as opposed to even just past clients. They, they're actually people who all day, every day are meeting with people that are preparing to have a need in real estate. Right. So um, fun that you've um, adopted that model and are using it, um, you know, and, 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 you know, have been for, of course, far longer than I've um, you know, been, been, you know, even teaching these concepts, but uh, great stuff. Is there anything else? I mean, from a tactical side, I, I want to go maybe a little bit deeper on this case. So you've got 40 people. How do you keep track of who's in, who's in the 40? Like does Shireen hand you that same 40 list every day you walk out the door or what is like, what's the tactical to be sure that Jamie doesn't forget the 40 people that, that are front and center in life right now? Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a real visual guy. You know, I like to see things on a board. And I, I like to look at it. I like to see my ongoing transactions, those kinds of things. Um, so I have an actual written out list that I look at every day. It's in front of my desk. And I'm like, okay, where am I with these people? How long has it been since I've touched base with that? Um, recently, too, um, our production manager, our operations manager, Mike uh, Rorig, has printed it out for me and kind of set something up where I'm like, okay, I'm checking it off that I actually touched base with these folks because you know, when you're producing this much also, it sometimes you forget to continue to prospect. Yeah. You know, you, it, when I fill up my pipeline to, you know, 15, 20 transactions, then I'm like, okay, I get really focused on closing those transactions. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I tend to um, get away from prospecting. Well, this is a good reminder for me to get back into the prospecting mode because the last thing you want to do is get down to the, you know, your last three, four or five transactions you've closed and you have nothing else there. That's something I learned the hard way in the past, but this, this helps us a ton to get past that. 
Yeah, and what we realized too is because Jamie's so visual, like we've tried digital, you know, we've tried different formats, but he's just a he's just a paper guy. Like it's just easier and you literally check it off the box. And, you know, we have a weekly, you know, managers meeting uh, in our team and we'll go through that list and we'll be like, who's on the list? Who's still on the list? Who's off the list? Who needs to be added? Um, we have a lot of little systems in place too. Like whenever we get a review, we send somebody a gift. Um, whenever we get a referral, we send them a gift. And even if the referral doesn't come to fruition or even if, you know, the transaction never closes, it doesn't matter. We reward the behavior. So yeah. that's the kind of stuff that we focus on. And um, not just for that top 40, you know, there, there's a kind of like that's the core group. But then, you know, there's like a secondary group um, and that secondary group gets invited to our annual client appreciation event. And I think this year was our ninth or 10th. Honestly, I kind of lose track. Yeah. But um, it, we're, you know, we're big like relationship people. This is how we actually do business. And, you know, when you're in and out of somebody's home, like you're part of their family too. So we treat them like family and we get together. So this year was really challenging because clearly nobody's partying. <laughs> you know, we're not having big events. We're not getting together. So, um, but, you know, people are starved even more for um, that interaction, yeah, you know, absolutely. and that FaceTime together. So we did a virtual event. <laughs> and it was a little bit last minute and I had no idea if it was going to be very successful. We had, you know, we just really didn't know, but one of our clients is an amazing baker and she hooked me up with another local and um, small business owner. And I love to support small business and um, especially if they're in our community and they did these like gorgeous, like charcuterie boards. So we thought, you know what, what if we hand delivered a really amazing like party platter and then we all just hop on zoom and chat and you know cheers and we didn't have like a big agenda but um the nice thing about that is like our team you know was able to deliver and get get a little bit of face time with our clients and everybody really enjoyed that it was surprisingly a fun zoom it was really interesting too who um who participated in the zoom um and um the response we got back from it um from clients that maybe we hadn't interacted with as much but they were just seeking that, um, hey, gosh, this that community. And it was really powerful. You know, one of my practices, you know, that I do uh, is that I go deep with agents on kind of creating a business plan. And it's been interesting how many of them to me said, well, I can't do client events anymore. And they just cross it off as if like mm -hmm. it's, it's an impossibility. And I'm like, wait a minute here. And I'll share examples mm -hmm. like you guys just shared that like, it doesn't mean you need to jeopardize people's safety and health to put on a client event. You can be very creative, with, uh, you know, about mm -hmm. the way you go and do it. And if the goal of marketing is to stand out and to get your message across and actually serve people's needs at the highest level, like there's probably never been a need for people to be social, safe, but yeah. social yeah. than right now. Like, I really think that we're missing a huge opportunity if we're not doing what you, the Beltrans just described, which is there's an opportunity here to support local business to mm -hmm. give people connection who are lonely and and, and on and on, right? Yeah. Uh, and at the same time, really pour back into the people that you love. Like, it's awesome. I'm so glad you guys are doing that. Thanks. Good stuff. Um, and, and I also want to point something else out that I think for anybody listening here, whether you've got the good fortune to have built the kind of business that the Beltrans have where you have people who are, um, are on your team, operations managers, et cetera. Some of you might be saying, well, like, that doesn't apply to me. I don't have an operations manager, right? Um, I still think you can have somebody, even if it's somebody in your office who you sit next to, or even that you zoom next to, right. Who can say like, these are the 40 people. I want you to like, put them in front of me once a week, send me an email with these 40 people, right. Just some sort of accountability. The fact that you put that in place, um, is brilliant. And again, you guys are, are, are in a great spot to be able to have people on your team do that. But I think that shouldn't preclude um, everyone else from not doing it if they don't have a team, right? Uh, um, absolutely. absolutely. You know, I mean, for the longest we time, didn't. it was just me on a whiteboard. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's on a whiteboard in front. It's still in front of me on a whiteboard. Um, you know, I look at that more than the handout that Mike gives me, you know, and, and he'll, you know, ask me, hey, did you reach out to these people? Yes. Yes, I have. And and it's not always a phone call. It, uh, many times it's just a text. Yeah. You know, it, it just, just staying in touch, you know, um, most of the time it is a phone call. I'm a big phone guy, you know, uh, I, I, I operate a lot more voice to voice, face to face, which has been super challenging in the last year, but um, nevertheless, it's my strength. So that's where I go. Yeah. yeah. And I was going to say, you know, it, it doesn't, you don't have to have people to, to be effective. Yeah. You know, I mean, 
for Jamie and I, yes, we've always, I've told every time I meet with an agent, I'm like, we've always had a team yeah. clearly. Cause at least there's two of us. Mm -hmm. But I mean, when it, when we didn't, and I was mostly a stay at home mom with two little boys, you know, we would use our vendor partners, you know, yeah. we partnered. There's a reason why our lender and our insurance, you know, and even like stagers and, you know, title people, they're super tight with us. Like we're a core group because we've leaned on them for years. Um, and they feed us and we feed them and we collaborate together. Um, you know, one of the other things that I love to do is, you know, mastermind with other agents. And I've always connected with other team leaders and been like, okay, what are you guys doing? You know, what are you seeing that's working out there? Tell me what's happening. Um, you know, and I met with, um, another team out of Sherwood just a couple weeks ago, asking them like, what do you do for Popeyes? I know you guys are big in the community. I know you're doing it well. Um, you know, so we just swap stories and we share ideas and, you know, people are willing to share if you just ask. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's what I think about, you know, if you don't have a team yet, like you do have a team that just are maybe not officially under your umbrella of your company name. Yeah, no, it's, it's a great paradigm shift that it really starts to <clears throat> eliminate the excuses that we all give ourselves, right? Um, of I don't have that, so I can't do that. Now, the reality is you can get a little bit creative mm -hmm. and figure out, find like follow success, success leaves clues. So what is it that, for example, the Beltrans are doing and how do I replicate that even if I don't have the same situation as them? So again, I'm thinking everybody here can, can take some of what you're saying and apply it. Um, <clears throat> outside of that, guys, is there any other advice or input you'd have with regards to this, this current market where it's really heavy listings, low buyers, maybe it's even around um, getting offers accepted? Like, obviously, you guys are heavy on the listing side right? Um, you're um, fortunate to be, to, to have built a business um, around that. You focused on that. Um, when you're accepting offers, like what are you looking for? Cause I'm sure there's people out there that are listening right now that are like, man, I'm on the, on the other side. I'd love to have inventory. I'd love to have listings, but I've got buyers and I'll, and I'm oftentimes one of 10. Um, yeah. What advice would you give to somebody who's submitting an offer on one of your properties on what really speaks to you? You know, I, that's a great question. Uh, Justin and I preach this to our team all the time. It, 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 good communication with the co-op agent. If if you're a buyer's agent, you need to be communicating with the listing agent constantly. Mm -hmm. They need to know that you are going to be somebody that can be reached, that's going to be um, uh, searching for common solutions. Mm -hmm. um, and then also, many times I'm I'll tell my client my my agents um, or our agents to. Ask the, ask the listing agent what they want. What is it that they want? And listen, <laughs> listen to it and apply it. Remove your ego of how you're going to do it and how you're going to shine. And what you do is mm -hmm. listen to the listing agent and, and actually apply what he says to your offer. Even if it means a last minute change, you know, this, this, this seller needs a rent back for 30 days. Okay, great. Here it is at the end. All right. We didn't initially submit it because I didn't talk to you, but now that you've told me here it is, and here's one better, I'm giving it to you for free. Mm -hmm. You know, these kinds of things are what make the difference. When I receive, you know, three to 10 offers on every listing that I get on, cause that's just the market right now, yeah. you know, I'm getting the vibe from the agent that's bringing in the offer. And when the seller comes to me and says, what do you think, Jamie? All of these offers are so great. What do you think? You know, I'm going to go back and say, well, you know, this particular agent has been Johnny on the spot. If, if, if by no other reason, let's go with this person. Yeah. I, I think that is probably yeah. the most critical piece of advice I could give anybody right now. Yeah, that's great insight. I think everybody can learn a ton from that because sometimes people think it's it's always about how much, right? How much the yeah. offer is. And it sounds yeah. like, yeah, if your offer falls, it doesn't matter how much it is, right? Yeah. And if yeah. you're not dependable, we'll get back to people. That's yeah. that's great, great insight. All right, let's move now to the kind of the next segment, which we want to talk about building a team. Right, I think um, everyone out there that's tried to scale a business has realized they can't do it just on their own merits. Mm -hmm. They have to start to attract and retain talent. Uh, what what principles do you, kind of help guide you guys to be, you know, to be able to attract someone like Mike, right. Who's um, a teaching and training agents himself. Um, to, like what advice would you have to people that are getting ready to, 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 to build a team and, or just want to build a bigger or a more solid team? What have you learned over the years? That is a loaded question mm -hmm. that, that can go so many different directions, <laughs> but I love it because, you know, one of the first things I talk about when I'm, you know, interviewing an agent or, you know, looking at adding to our team is, um, first of all, 
do you have <laughs> what it takes? Do you have grit? Can you make it in this business if you're new? Um, and then are you part of like our same style and ethics and, you know, are you coachable? So those are some of like the key things I look for, but really it's about, okay, we've built a business and, you know, it's our last name. And so basically it's kind of like, this is our baby. And are you a good enough babysitter? If I hand you my child, are you going to take good care of it? You know, and, um, you know, in essence, you're going to be wearing a jersey with Beltran on the la on your back. And I need to know that you're going to go out and represent our brand in the marketplace and that you're going to care about your clients, just mm -hmm. like we care about our clients, which means, you know, this is your mom, this is your sister, this is your, you know, cousin and uncle that you're taking care of. Um, so those are those are the, the traits that I look for in the people. Um, but overarching from that, it, it is always about the people. So it's not just about the client as the person, but it's also about the agent as a person, you know, mm -hmm. and one of the reasons we attract great agents is because we are, you know, exuding that, right? And um, they matter to us. So I like to think that we grow an organic team, but, you know, the way that Mike came to us, for example, was through a client referral. Like yeah. he was looking for a team to join. One of our clients was like, hey, I play basketball with this guy. He's a great agent. You guys should talk to him. And Mike's been in the business longer than us. You know, he's a principal broker. And when we met, he thought he was like, you know, applying for a sales position. But I looked at his, you know, background and I looked at his, you know, his education. I'm like, you have a degree in psychology and you love to train. So why are you applying for sales? You know, like basically right. I created a job suited to his talents. I took what he's a 10 at and I created a, a role around it. And that's why he's thriving and loving it. And, you know, it, it adds such a great value to our team and our agents to have somebody like a Mike. Mm. Um, but again, it, cause it's about the people, right? Not just the client people, but also the team, the agents. Man, I love that. You oftentimes hear people who say, yeah, find good talent and then, and then make a position for that person. Right. And mm -hmm. I, and I, it's rare, I think, to hear someone say where they actually did that and it worked out really well. Um, not to say that it works out poorly, but just few people actually apply that principle. And to hear you actually say that of, of like, you know, you didn't have an operations manager, but this guy came in the door and you thought, how do we, how do we find a spot for him that's really suited to him? Which again, goes back to your whole principle of like, it's always about the people, right? Jamie, you, you discuss that when it comes to like these, these 40 people, it's about the people, right? How do we actually pour into the people? Not just stay present with trip campaigns, but how do I actually pour into their lives and be present? And with the people on your team, same principle. I'm seeing this kind of underlying thread here of like, it's about the people, right? These people um, need to be like first and foremost, our, our customers, right? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. You know, um, I'm super fortunate to um, be partnering with Shireen in our business <laughs> because she does all of this um, groundwork, you know, where she's not only re um, bringing in the talent that we're potentially going to bring on. And, and then it finally comes to me. And then to me, it's always a cultural fit, right? Yeah. Are they going to fit our culture? Are they going to fit yeah. Shireen and I's culture, right? And, and Mike as well. And Ethan, you know, mm -hmm. both those guys have been with us five plus years. Um, and um, if they're not, if if there's a vibe that we don't get and, and, and any one of us kind of feel that, Mm, you know, maybe this isn't the right place. Maybe EXP yeah. is the right place for them, but not necessarily Bel Beltran Properties. Yeah. Um, so that that's always um, first and foremost, in my opinion, is is yeah. the culture going to fit? Do these people love people? Yeah, that's good. So good. You guys, so many nuggets out of that. Um, let's move to the last kind of segment, which is about um, building wealth, right? I think it's yeah. common for real estate agents to um, make good money and spend good money, yeah. right? Um, yeah. You know, you know, for whatever reason, and the profitability is is so critical. Um, and I've seen you guys, you know, put an emphasis on 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 building wealth. Talk to us a little bit about what principles you could teach agents that are listening out there right now. That it's like, you know what? Um, I actually want to build something that lasts far beyond these commission checks. Like something mm -hmm. that's actually going to, at some point, allow me to step down and, yeah. and 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 retire or pursue other interests beyond being in production. Um, you know, what have you learned about that concept that you could share with all of us? You know, um, this is actually something I'm super passionate about is, um, again, because it's about the people, you know, one of the things that I looked at when I was, you know, just looking at our P&Ls. OK, you can start there, like run it like a business and have a P&L and then learn how to read it. You know, I mean, uh -huh. we're not we're salespeople. We're not necessarily natural spreadsheet type people, but you can you can exercise that skill and, you know, get get good at it. 
Um, but start there. And again, when I was looking at everything, I was like, how am I going to retain amazing talent? You know, if it, what happens if our business dips and we have a slower year, am I going to lose, you know, my salaried employees? Um, and so I was looking for a way to, you know, create like a 401k or something, you know, that would retain these amazing talented people that we were bringing in. Um, and then that's when I, you know, found EXP and, you know, we can go into more of that detail too, but really it was about how do we pour back into our team? How do we help them net more? How do we net more so that we can help them net more? And again, I think it just starts with, you got to pay attention to the money in and pay attention to the money out and be willing to cut the things that don't make sense. Yeah. Stuff that's not <clears throat> producing some sort of return, right? Um, yep. Yeah, that's great. I mean, again, again, it goes back to the same principles of how do we best take care of our people, right? I mean, again, yep. I'm seeing this, this underlying theme. You guys found a model that was allowed you to best take care of your people, right? It's powerful. Um, it was interesting. I was actually listening on Clubhouse. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Clubhouse yet. Yeah, we're on there. It's fun. It is fun, isn't it? I was listening to uh, Grant Cardone speak um, early this morning, and he was talking about how at the end of every month, he tries to zero out his cash account, which maybe wouldn't be a good idea for most businesses, but his, he's pretty confident the next month will be, you know, ha like have a lot of cash flow as well. And he said, my goal is to turn that cash into, um, into an asset, you know, into mm -hmm. something that will then pay me uh, cash out the other end. Right. So he's got enough cash coming in from those assets that he can do that now. I think that's a, I, I thought, boy, that's a, that's mm -hmm. an awesome goal is to be able to take all of your cash and convert it into real property that then pays you cash, but passively. And it's even leveraged because you can, you know, obviously um, use that as down payment to, you know, to get more um, leverage, of course, to, to mm -hmm. purchase property that again, produces cash. Um, is there any advice you guys would have when it comes to, if an agent's coming in, um, when it comes to the opportunity of, you know, real estate investing, like, is there some uh, formula or, or um, person that you look to or a book you look to, or just principles that you've learned of how do we how do we take that money that, like you said, Shireen, that you keep and turn into something? Yeah. Whether you're flipping properties, or I don't know. I'd, yeah, I'd be your thoughts well, on that. You know, and the interesting thing is, Jamie and I did not start in real estate to become real estate salespeople. <laughs> this is not actually the the goal that we had. We were investors first, oh. and we learned that from my family. You know, my my grandfather was uh, in real estate in Northern Cal, like, and I remember growing up and like painting in rentals and like doing yard work around his, you know, his properties. And my parents did the same. And so Jamie and I had started um, and, and we didn't have massive incomes and we just had good credit and, and willingness. So we started by buying and we'd move into it so that we could get an owner occupied rate. We'd stay there for two years and then we'd move on to the next one. We'd buy it and we, you know, move it. So that's how we started. Um, I got my license just to save on commissions and, you know, if we were going to sell properties and then, you know, eventually we both went into it together full time. But again, I think the most important thing is it's not just a one, you know, style fits all. It's about you and your goals because every family is going to have different goals. Um, every family is going to have a different comfort level. You know, Jamie and I are both risk takers and we <laughs> recognize that not everyone would be comfortable doing some of the, you know, kind of crazy things that we've done, you know, like not everybody wants to move every two years and keep, keep boxes stored in their garage for the next move, you know, but again, you have to, you have to like know who you're talking to and know what your comfort level is. You know, over the years we've done quite a few, um, you know, uh, um, meetings where we've just talked with our, some of our clients on like, Hey, how do you get started Invest, yeah. investing? Um, and you know, it's, some people, it takes them a few years to even just wrap their brain around, do I want to have a rental property? Do I want to be a landlord? And how does that work? And what does it look like? Um, and even next week, I'm doing um, a mastermind on Airbnb and, you know, learning from a couple other agents who've done the same and, you know, either bought an Airbnb or rehabbing one or helping their clients with one. So, you know, I guess it's just a matter of what are you interested in and how can you, you know, how can you fit that in and to your lifestyle and your goals? Yeah. I love that. I think uh, Gary Keller actually said like, sell the homes that you don't buy. <laughs> right. And I think that that's kind of sounds like you guys came into the industry yes. through, you know, with an investor lens on of like, Hey, yeah. we're, we're in this to actually get out of this, right. To get in, to actually build wealth that allows us to be free or not. Right. I mean, we can, we can choose to stay in production, but at least we have the option because we build assets around that. Oh yeah. Uh, and, and 
I love the fact that you're teaching and training, which kind of um, leads us into our next question. I know you hold masterminds, you know, with agents, obviously leading a team, um, you know, within your brokerage. Uh, <clears throat> what does that look like for you guys? And, and I'll kind of position it this way. Is it both of you are big thinkers? Um, I've had the good fortune of, you know, knowing Jamie for probably what, close to 10 years maybe, and obviously been in yeah. this industry for, for six years. Mm -hmm. And it's been fun to see your growth, both of you. And I think even more recently, I've seen a, got a lot of growth. Um, what do you guys do to continue to grow yourselves, to continue to be big thinkers, continue to expand your possibilities? What does that look like? <laughs> we both look at each other. Um, you know, I guess I'm just a lifelong learner and I'm a nerd and I'm a reader, so I will never stop learning. I will never stop, you know, pouring into my brain. Um, I'm always reading. I probably have like 10 books that I'm reading all always, but um, I guess it's just about, you know, setting the stage for yourself of like, where do you want to be and taking yourself there mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually, you know, it, it's all about being well-rounded in all of those areas. Um, so that if you're taking good care of yourself, you can help take care of your family really well. And then you help take care of your family. Then, it, you know, you can help take care of your clients and then you help take care of your clients and your community. Um, we're just big, like pour back into yourself so that you can overflow. You know, I know Jamie's tackling some really big community things over the next couple of years and, you know, kind of just challenging himself to do more. And I guess that's just who we are, honestly. <laughs> You know, um, speaking for myself, I've, I feel like I've always been very ambitious in, in any career that I've done, but I was fortunate enough to marry Shireen that, and, and, and she is this lifelong learner. And really, I have just um, followed her, followed her um, uh, willingness to grow and, 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 and do that and, and challenged myself to be like, okay, I'm interested in this topic. Okay, what, you know, how do I learn? Okay. Get a book about it, read, dive into it, get into it, you know? Um, so, so for me, it's, it's really been, um, that ambition tied to, um, what I've been able to learn from Shireen in regards to just growth. It's awesome. Yes. It's just a good partnership, yeah. you know, and just like any team that you're building, you know, you, it's about the people, right? So yeah. pick good people. <laughs> it's a great theme for today. I want to thank you both for everything you've contributed here, everything you've shared both on, um, you know, building business, building team, um, building wealth and building yourselves, just tons of nuggets here. I'm excited for that. Um, again, if people are listening to this and they found value, uh, please thank, uh, these two, uh, share this with people who need to hear this, need to hear these components of building a successful business, a successful life. So, and, uh, thank you both. I admire you both. I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for the friendship and excited to see your continued growth, uh, moving forward. So, um, and my uh, final request of everybody listening here today, um, our three simple words, and they are go think bigger. Thank you too so much again. Such a pleasure. Thank, Thank you, Justin. You, Justin.